Well, greetings, everybody. In this episode, we're going to cover the mast hoops, demolishing the rotten cockpit sole, and a little tip on how to recolor your navigational light globes. Those days this last winter when I couldn't do any work on the boat outside, I took every opportunity I could to get anything else done, including the mast hoops. The inner diameter of these mast hoops is about six and a half inches. So the first thing I did was make a form that the steam bent pieces of wood would wrap around. It didn't need to be anything terribly sophisticated. I was able to make it out of an old piece of plywood, cut out on my bandsaw, and I added a few things to it, including this notch. This would allow the tapered end of the steam piece of wood to fit inside and hopefully hold it there while I twisted it around. Now it was time to get a few parts to make my steamer. It didn't need to be anything elaborate. I really didn't need to build a huge steamer box since these strips were going to be very thin. So instead of a steamer box, I just use a spare piece of West Virginia ivory and a little portable butane burner to generate the heat. With my mast hoop form clamped onto a bench, it was ready to go. Each of the strips of wood was mahogany, a little over a quarter of an inch thick, which was the closest I could get it on the technique I was using on my table saw. All of the ends had been sanded down into a taper to get them as thin as possible to fit into that slot on the form. I added some holes along the side to use for clamps in case I needed an extra hand to hold onto things while I was continuing to wrap the wood around. As I mentioned in a previous video, I'm using Gorilla Glue on this. It's a polyurethane based glue that cures in the presence of water, so since these were going to be steam, I thought that would be perfect. So it was time to put the wood in the steamer tube and light the burner. I put about four pieces in the steamer tube at once and let them steam in there for about 30 minutes, which should have been enough for that thickness of wood. I was already aware of one problem that I was facing. It's best to use wood that hasn't been kiln dried because the lignin is still present and allows you to bend it. Once the wood has been kiln dried, that lignin is pretty well set. So I was concerned about how brittle the wood was going to be even if I'd steamed it for a good long time. I pulled the first piece of wood out, put it in the form, and started bending it around. The wood did go around the form, but I could feel it really resisting and almost on the verge of breaking. But I did manage to get one decent hoop out of it. Then I moved on to the second piece, and it cracked almost immediately. I tried a third piece, and a fourth piece, and a fifth piece. And no matter how gently I tried to bring it around, it invariably snapped. Well, this wasn't going to happen today, and I need to rethink how I'm going to do this. So I'll get back to attempt number two at making the mast tubes a little later in this episode. But since this day seemed to be about things breaking, I figured it might be a good opportunity to go ahead and take out the cockpit sole and see what was going on underneath there. Since I didn't know what was under there as far as supports, I didn't want to take too much out until I understood what was going on underneath there. So I just took out a small piece at first just to get a look. There was just a top layer of fiberglass, an underlaying piece of fiberglass, and the core was gone. I took out this first piece and could feel that it's still completely wet, even though there hasn't been any rainfall or water on this cockpit in months. Getting a brief look underneath, I could see that there were two supports, one near the front and one near the back. As I went out from the center of the cockpit, I could see more and more evidence of rotted core. In some places, I found remnants of a wood core that was nothing but sponge. Other places were just completely gone and there was nothing there but a void between two pieces of fiberglass. It took me the better part of two days to rip the entire thing out. Both of the small support beams that held the cockpit up from underneath were completely rotted. Since I wanted to put a lot more support under the cockpit sole than was originally there, I decided to take the sole back almost to the gunnels, to where I could find a good solid core with no damage to tie the new cockpit sole into. And as much as I really didn't want to do it, I decided to take the port side fiberglass seat out. It was extremely soft and flexible and I could tell the core damage was pretty severe in there as well. You can see areas where there was no core left whatsoever, other areas just had rotting core in it, and others of it were solid enough that I couldn't get the underside of the fiberglass off to try and clean it out. So I'll use this as a pattern for my future seat, 
but I couldn't find any practical way to keep it and repair it. With the decking now gone, I could clearly see the self-bailing drain for the cockpit on the port side. On the starboard side, there was an old Rule 800 bilge pump. I'm going to replace that, but I am going to keep it as they have a pretty good reputation and I wouldn't mind having a backup. The next thing to do was to cut some forms that would fit along the bottom of the hull and support the new cockpit sole. There's only one way I know of to measure the bottom of a hull curve. You just take several small pieces of wood, adhere it to the straight edge, and it gives you a perfect form of the bottom. You can then transpose that curve to a piece of wood and get a perfect match every single time. Arriving just in time to start working on the new cockpit sole supports was my epoxy kit. I've used West Systems before, it's a great product, it does a great job, but there are a lot of things I'm going to need for this boat so budget was an issue. I started looking around a little bit and found out that Jamestown Distributors has their own 5 to 1 epoxy system. Doing some research I found several people who said it worked just as well as the West Systems epoxy, and the price point on the total boat product is a little better. Both the epoxy resin and the hardener are not as expensive as the West System, and the total boat kit comes with the pumps, which is something you have to buy separately with the West System's epoxy, and that adds to the price even more. So with a better price point and good reviews, I thought I'd give it a try and see how it worked. After using my templates to cut out the forms, which were made from various pieces of hardwood as well as marine plywood, the first step was to coat each of the edges of all of the wood, hardwood and plywood alike, with a coat of epoxy to seal it. This is especially important for the end grain of the hardwood and along any edge with the plywood. This is just using a straight mix of 5 to 1 epoxy, just brushing it on with a cheap brush and making sure that all the edges got covered and sealed. Letting that cure for 24 hours, the next step was to start to apply some of the fiberglass. This adds strength to it. The fiberglass I got was a very tight weave and it took a lot of epoxy to get it properly wetted down. So applying a fresh coat of epoxy onto the wood and the edges, laying out the fiberglass, then applying another coat of epoxy over top until the cloth was completely saturated, and then taking care of any air pockets with the brush or roller tools. I'm going to leave a link below to a video that I've watched several times that is the best demonstration of how to prepare marine plywood for application on a boat like this. The YouTube channel is Boatworks Today, and Andy, the guy who creates all these videos, is one of the top experts out there on how to do just about anything with a boat. So if you want the detailed instructions, which I'd highly recommend looking over, take a look down below for Andy at Boatworks Today on applying epoxy and fiberglass to marine plywood. After a couple days of applying epoxy and fiberglass to the wood to seal it and strengthen it, it was time to raise the mast, give me some headroom, and start installing the new cockpit sole structural supports. Before I got into that though, I wanted to take care of the through hull that was responsible for the cockpit bailing system. This wasn't something I was going to easily be able to get to again, and I might as well go ahead and take care of it now. It's really important to take care of the wood core when doing anything that goes through fiberglass like this. So the first step after removing the fitting itself was to drill the hole a little bit bigger then fill it with epoxy. Here's why that's important. It's not really a question of if, it's a question of when water is finally going to get through the opening for a fitting and get somewhere where you don't want it. As such, any little bit of water that gets trapped in the core will start to lead to rot. So here's how to protect yourself against that. First off, I open the hole up just a little bit bigger than it takes for the fitting. I seal the bottom to keep the epoxy from running out and then pour in some slightly thickened epoxy into the hole and let it cure. After that I re-drill the hole for the fitting and run it through. This way the wood core has epoxy insulating it from any water that might make it through the hole for the fitting and keep it from getting wet and rotting. I'll be doing this as well with every deck fitting I put back on the top of the boat as well. I clean this bronze fitting up with a brass wire brush on my drill press and it turned out pretty nicely. Using some marine sealant compound from 3M to hold the bottom fitting in, I first mixed up another batch of epoxy. Even though I already had the core insulated with the epoxy I just applied, I wanted to seal the entire area up with a little unthickened epoxy. After tightening the top fitting down, I then added one more layer of thickened epoxy to completely seal the whole thing up. So once the new cockpit sole goes back in, I'll reattach the hose and hopefully the baler won't need any attention for a good long time. Now it's time to finally start putting the supports in. 
After vacuuming the surface and cleaning it with some acetone to get any dust off, I applied a healthy amount of thickened epoxy. This provides a good surface for the new fiberglass covered boards to come in and adhere better to the existing hull. The next step is to make a fillet between the board and the hull with some heavily thickened epoxy. Brushing it in at first just to get the material there, after all of the thickened epoxy is applied, you can use something simple like a rounded off stir stick to create a radius along the bottom. The next step is to apply some fiberglass to really bind this support to the bottom of the hull. Frankly, the best way I found to do this is to mix up some epoxy in a cup and take the strip of fiberglass, ball it up, put it inside the cup, and mix the whole thing with your hand like you're kneading some dough. It's the only way I found to effectively get epoxy into every fiberglass weave. Once you've balled it up in your hands a few times with all the epoxy, open it up and it's ready to apply. Now even though I have some special roller tools that are meant for this, sometimes there's just no substitute with using your hand to get it to go to the places where you need it to stick and make it form up against the wood and the hull just the way you want it. All of those little white areas along the bottom of the hull are air pockets that I need to work out. After I installed all four supports with all of the epoxy and fiberglass applied, it was time to give it a couple of days to cure. So in the meantime, back to the mast hoops. The two problems that I faced before were primarily that the wood was too thick and that I was trying to do this with wood that had already been kiln dried, which meant that the lignin in it wasn't going to bend very much no matter how much I steamed it. The only solution I could come up with, since I couldn't find any wood that wasn't already kiln dried at any of the wood stores, was to make the strips longer and thinner and I also had the idea to soak them in water ahead of time to allow the heat to better transfer through the wood once it started to steam up. The previous technique I had used to make the wood strips was to put the fence as close as I could to the blade while still being safe. This isn't a terribly safe process to begin with, but the closest I could get it still wasn't good enough. So I had to go to another technique, which was to use a magnetically adhered stop block on the other side of the blade and move the fence incrementally as each strip was cut. Again, this is not the safest way to do this, but if you're very careful and you plan ahead, it can be done safely. Then every time I cut a strip, I would replace the new piece of shortened wood up against the stop block and move the fence in incrementally. As long as that stop block on the left side of the blade didn't move, I would get a very consistent cut every single time. And I could make the strips much, much thinner. Each of these strips was about two feet longer than the previous ones, and they were less than a quarter of an inch thick. The next step was to put the taper on the end of each piece of wood. This is done by placing it against a scrap piece of wood and pushing it against the oscillating belt sander at a slight angle. It gave me a perfect taper every single time without risking breaking the wood or getting my hands too close to the belt with such a thin piece of wood. The next step was to soak the wood. The heat transfer from the steam would be much more efficient if the wood was already saturated with water. So again, I just placed all the strips in a piece of West Virginia ivory, filled it full of water, and let it sit for about an hour. It was time to rig up the steam box again. Just a simple cheap soup pot sitting on top of a little portable butane burner, and a small flexible pipe feeding the steam into a larger pipe. I put about four pieces at a time in, lit it up, and let it steam. After about a half hour, I pulled the first piece out and gave it a shot. After clamping the end down and starting to bend it around, the next step was to apply some of the polyurethane glue onto the wet surface, wrap it around some more, clamp it down to hold it, apply some more glue and just keep repeating the process. I didn't have one single piece break on me this time. So the thinner wood and soaking it appeared to have been the trick. Nevertheless, this was still a more difficult process than it looks. It's one of those things where having another set of hands really would have helped. But I did get through it and get all my mast hoops plus a couple of spares. It was important to have some transverse support for each of the hoops. So I used a Forstner bit to drill some holes where the wood strips began on the outside, ended on the inside, and some other regular intervals throughout the hoop. Then soaked it in water for just a few minutes to get the surface wet. Got some polyurethane glue, applied it inside the hole and on the outside of a walnut dowel and just gently screwed it in until it was flush with the inside and then cut it off flush with the outside. I let all that cure for about 24 hours and then it was time to really make these things shine and put them on the belt sander. 
The sanding not only took care of the excess glue on the inside and outside, it also made the dowels flush with the hoops and really made them pop out, visually speaking of course. So after a lot of hard work and a little bit of trial and error, I think they turned out pretty nicely. Last thing to do was to apply a finish to them. I decided to use a semi-gloss polyurethane. This is a water-based polyurethane and it went on quite easily. After several coats, I think they turned out really nicely. Dare I even say, pretty dang spiffy. After the finish dried on them, I tried to bend these hoops as hard as I could. They're essentially round pieces of plywood and they are extremely strong. I couldn't get them to bend at all. Now there's one last thing in this episode I want to cover quickly. I showed you in a previous episode that I picked up these great bronze antique running lights. They don't make them like this anymore. These are heavy solid bronze and the globes in them are still glass. All in all they're in excellent shape, but the green starboard globe had some of its color filter missing. Pretty understandable considering how old it is, but that needed to be repaired. So I used some lacquer thinner to take the old color film off, and after doing some research I found this. It's a paint put out by testers. It's a spray enamel that dries clear. I applied painter's tape to the outside and the rim of the globe because I didn't want to get paint on that part, just the inside. And after three light applications, it came out to be the perfect shade of navigational light green. In the next episode, I'm going to start painting the mast and the booms, continue work on the cockpit sole support structures, as well as start putting the cockpit sole in using reclaimed pine planks from the 1920s and anything else I have time to work up. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to drop them below. I'll be back as soon as I can with another episode. Thanks for watching.